Hi there, my name's Nancy. I'm 21 years old, and three years ago, I married the love of my life. Everything seemed to be going great. Even though my husband is Spanish, we didn't have many problems except for the language barrier. To show my love, I decided to learn Spanish so I could talk better with him and his family. That's how much I loved him. I was doing this in secret. Johnson, my husband, and Mary, my mother-in-law, didn't know I was learning Spanish. Not only was I learning, but I got pretty good at it. I knew that if I was in Spain, I could manage. You might be wondering, if I'm so good at Spanish, why doesn't my husband know? Well, I was a bit shy. It can be scary trying to speak a new language, especially with people you're close to. But I decided it was time to stop hiding. I needed to speak Spanish with both my husband and my mother-in-law. After all, I learned it to make communication easier, right? Well, it's a good thing I didn't start speaking Spanish right away because I found out some surprising information one day that led to a series of unfortunate events. Hello, Mama. How are you, my son? Thank you for inviting me over this lovely Sunday afternoon. It was our pleasure, Mom. Hello, Mama. Hello, my daughter. How are you? Thank you so much for including me. Oh, hush, you know you're always wanted and welcome here. I brought some croissants and how do you Americans say, um, bagels? Yes, bagels and croissants for our afternoon tea. Oh, how lovely. Thank you so much. Come, come and sit, Mama. The food will be ready soon. Did she prepare the food? No, I did most of the prep. Don't worry. Oh, thank God. Hearing this, I wondered what she meant by that but I was too shy to ask. How strange. Mary always seemed to like my cooking. Why was she saying those things? At the time, I thought maybe she just wanted to eat food made by her son that day. Maybe she wanted to taste food that reminded her of old times. Then I heard her say, I hate her cooking. Why did you invite me here instead of taking me to a cafe so we could avoid her? Mom, we agreed to speak in English so Nancy doesn't feel left out, remember? Oh, forgive me, my sweet daughter. I was just saying that the food looks so good. I was surprised to learn that my son made it. Oh, I wish it was you who made it. I love your cooking. At this point, I was confused. How could she say such awful things in Spanish and then lie to my face in English? I thought I might have misunderstood but I had a plan to confirm what I heard. Oh, please don't worry. You should never feel ashamed to speak your native tongue. Go right ahead. I'll be fine. I wanted to catch what she was saying, so I planned to use the Google Translate app to record her and make sure I understood correctly. We all sat at the table, getting ready to eat, and what came next shocked me to the core. I want us to discuss our plan. The time is approaching. It's literally tomorrow. Johnson, you have to be serious. The app, along with my Spanish knowledge, confirmed there was some plan going on, but I didn't know what it was. Mama, not now. I said I would handle it. What are you going to tell her? Nancy, darling, please pass me the sugar. She doesn't know anything about the plan. I was just going to tell her that I would be out of town. Out of town? What for? What was going on? I was so confused. I was constantly looking down at my phone to see what the app was translating. I think they assumed I wasn't paying attention and became less careful with their words, which was good for me as I was learning their true feelings. She's not too smart. Look at her glued to her phone. We can talk about this now. Okay, Mama. Fine. What do you want to discuss? The plane is leaving at 2 p.m. Are you sure you'll be able to escape her then? Escape me? What for? I was so confused, but I stayed calm and pretended not to understand so I could plan my next move. Yes, Mama, I know. I will do what needs to be done. I know how important this is. It is extremely important. If your great uncle doesn't see us tomorrow, he will give the house to someone else, like your cousin or your aunt. We can't let that happen. No one needs to know about this house. Oh, Mama, you're so funny. Don't worry. I just said that in English so she doesn't suspect what we're talking about. Who, Nancy? Yes, 
Oh, sorry, my love. I was just asking who made this delicious tea. It's splendid. Oh, that would be your talented son. I'm afraid I'm not as good as he is when it comes to these things. Oh, darling, your food is amazing, amazingly terrible. Mom, she will catch you. She can't catch me. She's too stupid to understand us. I don't know, Mom. She obviously understands some basics, I think. Let's see. Nancy, how much Spanish do you know? At this moment, I knew I had to lie. I said I didn't know much so they would keep exposing themselves and I could keep learning their true colors. How I managed to stay calm while being insulted still amazes me. I guess I knew it was more important to handle this situation than to get emotional right then. I said, oh, I'm still very bad at Spanish. I only know the typical things like buen dia and como te llamas, but that's it. Oh, that simply won't do, darling. You should learn some more Spanish. Yes, ma'am, I will. Well, it's a good thing for Johnson and me, as we can gossip about you. I'm just, how do you say, kidding with you, mi cariño. We would never do that to you. Are we doing it right now? Yes, which makes this extra funny. They laughed, and I kept using Google Translate. I also checked other apps, websites, and forums to see if what they were saying was correct. I got about 99% confirmation from these sources. Now that I knew they clearly didn't like me and were making fun of me, I had to gather as much information as possible, even though their insults were hurting me. The next thing I heard shattered my resolve. As I was saying, this house is extremely important. No one can know about this house, okay? We need to be the only ones knowing because we could make a lot of money. We can't lose this opportunity. I'm so glad we're doing this. It's a good thing we didn't tell my wife because I don't want to share the spoils. Me neither. Everything needs to go smoothly. Your great uncle Jack said that whoever contacts him first about this issue will inherit the mansion. So we need to go there physically before anyone else and start working on remodeling and improving the house. I can't wait to have a house in New Hampshire. This is where I'll go to escape my wife and my life here in Mississippi. Sometimes I can't stand her. You know you're still young, way too young to be married to someone like her. Come and live with me in New Hampshire. You can enjoy your youth with women and booze, have a good time, and then settle down when you're ready. Let's leave this place. Honestly, Mama, I think you're right. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I felt tears welling up. Excuse me, what's wrong? Is everything okay? Yes, I just need to get something from the kitchen. I couldn't listen to them anymore. I needed to collect myself and not make a scene. How could they say those awful things with me right there in the room? Did they have no shame? I was so upset. I began pacing up and down the kitchen, and then I saw my mother-in-law's purse sitting on the counter. I decided to look inside and take her phone. Luckily, it was unlocked. I opened her WhatsApp and sent Uncle Jack's number to my phone. I quickly deleted the text from her phone, so it looked like nothing happened. It felt like I was acting on instinct. I didn't know why I did it, but I was glad because I was now planning to get back at them. I returned to the dining room where the conversation was still going on. They seemed to be talking about the same thing. So tomorrow we leave for the vacation. I think it's well-deserved because of all the hard work we've been doing. I second that. We deserve this break. Is everything okay? Yes, honey, we were just talking about the weather and how it's a perfect day to go relax somewhere. Would you like us to do that? Maybe not today, scene. Oh, okay. When would you like to go then? Maybe tomorrow? Both Mary and Johnson froze slightly. I was looking for their reaction and noticed it. I don't think tomorrow would be possible. I asked Sine to help me with some things around the house. Oh, what things? Why is she asking so many questions? Um, just to move things around. I can help too, if you like. That won't be necessary. See how nosy she is being. I don't like it one bit. Do you see why you have to leave this place? Don't worry, Mama. I've got this handled. I still managed to keep a smile despite knowing what they were saying. 
I was looking forward to my plan for revenge. I continued recording their conversations until the very end to make sure I had all the details. As I mentioned before, my Spanish was getting pretty good, but I still wanted to make sure I got the right information. That night, I snuck away from the bedroom and went to the office to do some more investigating. I replayed the audio, and sure enough, my doubts about my accuracy were gone. From this whole ordeal, I learned that there was a vacation planned for tomorrow to go and claim a house from Great Uncle Jack and that these people apparently hated me and were planning to leave me. A bonus piece of information I got was when I went to the kitchen to pace. I had left my phone, which was still recording, in the room with my husband and mother-in-law, and I managed to pick up some more useful information. The conversation consisted of Mary asking Johnson about his computer password because she wanted to change some aspects of their flight. I managed to get the password and flight details. I must have hit the jackpot. I logged into John's computer, and sure enough, there were flight details on the website where he booked the tickets. Feeling very sneaky and devious, I may or may not have changed their flight details, pushing their flight to the day after tomorrow. This was just phase one of my plans. There was a lot more to come. Since I had sent myself Great Uncle Jack's number, I was ready to do what I needed to do. Hello, Uncle Jack, it's Nancy. Oh, hello, darling. How are you doing? Is everything okay? Well, no, not really. I went into great detail explaining what had happened that day. I even sent him the audio recording as proof because, without it, I doubt he would have believed me. We cut the call so he could listen to the voice recordings, and we talked again after he finished listening. Wow, I don't even know what to say. How could Mary and Johnson do this? They were such sweet and innocent people when they were younger. How could they do this to you, to me? I know, it's a lot to take in, it was shocking to me too. You have indeed improved your Spanish. Well done. Thanks, Jack. But now that we know this, what do we do? Well, obviously they're not going to get the house. That's a fact. After hearing all of this, there is no way that I would never give such a valuable and honorable gift to people who plan to ruin it with their evilness and foolishness. Okay, I get it. It's your house, and you have every right to do what you want with it. Yes, I do. From now on, I will ignore their calls. Let's see how they feel about that. Thanks again for bringing this to my attention. You are a good and kind-hearted person, Nancy. Please don't let the ugliness of this world change you. Thank you for your time and willingness to listen. Hearing what you heard today couldn't have been easy. I applaud you for your strength. Please take care, Uncle Jack. You too, love. Good night. With that, I knew I had secured the downfall of both Mary and Johnson. Now that everything was set, I just had to wait for the right moment to make my move. When I got back to the bedroom, Johnson was still fast asleep. It hurt to know that my husband, whom I love dearly, would treat me this way. I didn't know he felt all those things, and maybe if we had talked, we could have found a solution. But he chose to be deceitful. I took his phone and turned off his alarm. Without it, he would surely oversleep, and that's exactly what happened. I packed my things and went to a hotel for the night. I couldn't stay in the house with someone like that. The next day, absolute chaos ensued. I'm sure John woke up to a hundred missed calls from his mother and was frantically packing because he hadn't packed the day before. I suspect this because I got a call from him at 1 p.m. Where the hell are you? Why didn't my alarm go off and why aren't you here? Oh, I decided to take a little vacation day for myself. Oh, that's nice. A little heads up would have been appreciated, though. Yeah, likewise, scene. What? What do you mean? Anyways, that doesn't matter. I'm running late for my flight. I mean my meeting with mom. Why are you in such a hurry? I'm sure she wouldn't mind you being a little bit late. You don't understand. Anyway, it's fine. I won't be home tonight and tomorrow night. I've got a lot I need to do. See you later. Before I could even respond, he hung up. I'm pretty sure he was so overwhelmed 
that he didn't even check the proper details of his ticket, which I had changed to the next day. Through the Find My iPhone app, I saw that he made his way to the airport. Imagine waking up, rushing out of the house with only minutes to spare to make it to your flight, just to find out that it had been cancelled. I'm sure he was moving like a madman up and down that airport. I could almost see him frantically checking his phone, realizing the flight details were wrong. Suddenly, I received a call from Mary. What have you done? What do you mean, Mary? Drop the act, I know you tampered with our flight. If by tampered you mean changed the date, then yes, that's exactly what I did. Why would you do that? I was trying to help you guys out. Didn't you say you wanted John's help with moving some stuff around? I noticed that you had the flight booked for today, the same day John was supposed to help you, so I decided to change some things. You're welcome. Johnson, come and talk to your wife before I reach through the phone and strangle her. Johnson grabs the phone. Listen here, Nancy. I don't know what you've done, but whatever it is, stop it right now. Uncle Jack still isn't answering his phone. Try again, Mary said, her voice shaking with frustration. He isn't answering his phone because he doesn't want to speak with you too, I replied calmly. You, you can understand us, Johnson asked sounding shocked. Every last word. But, but how? I've been practicing, I said, feeling a strange mix of satisfaction and sadness. I've been learning Spanish so I could communicate better with you and your mom. But now I see it also helped me uncover your plans. Johnson's face went pale. You, you knew all along. Yes, I heard everything. Your plans to leave me, to claim the house without me knowing. I heard it all. Johnson and Mary were silent. I could hear their heavy breathing over the phone, the shock and fear evident in their silence. So what now? Johnson finally asked. Now, you deal with the consequences of your actions, I said. I already spoke to Uncle Jack. He knows everything. You won't be getting that house. But Nancy, you don't understand. Johnson pleaded. We had no choice. We needed that house. You had a choice, I said firmly. You could have been honest with me. Instead, you chose to deceive me. Now you have to live with the consequences. There was another long silence. Then Mary spoke, her voice trembling. Nancy, we're sorry. We didn't mean for it to go this far. It's too late for apologies, I replied. You made your bed. Now you have to lie in it. I hung up the phone and took a deep breath. It was done. I had exposed their plans and ensured they wouldn't get the house. I felt a sense of relief, but also a deep sadness. The man I loved, the family I thought I was a part of, had betrayed me. But I knew I had to move on. I packed my things and checked out of the hotel. I decided to stay with a friend for a while until I figured out my next steps. As I walked out of the hotel, I felt a mix of emotions, anger, sadness, relief, but most of all, a sense of empowerment. I had stood up for myself and taken control of the situation. And now, I was ready to start a new chapter in my life, free from deceit and betrayal. I told you, Mama, I told you she might hear us. So that means yesterday you heard everything? Yep, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to divorce your good-for-nothing son and leave you two to deal with each other. How blessed day. Oh, and next time you want to talk about someone with them right there in the room, make sure they don't understand what you're saying. Have a nice life. I hung up before they could respond. I was done with their nonsense. Later that day, I got a call from Uncle Jack. Hello, dear. How are you? I'm a bit upset. I just had an ugly fight with John and Mary, and now I'm getting a divorce from him. I'm so sorry that things turned out this way, Nancy. It's part of life, I guess. How are things on your end? Well, I finally spoke to them and gave them a piece of my mind. They are not happy. What did you say to them? I told John that he's an idiot for treating you the way he did, and told Mary that she's evil for roping her son into her schemes. I also told them that I have given you the house. You what? Yes, dear, the mansion is yours. Even if you get a divorce from John, 
it's all yours, and you can share it with whomever you please. I, I don't know what to say, Jack, it's too much. I wanted this house to go to someone kind and compassionate, but also tough and strong when needed. That's exactly who you are. A house is the least I could do after all the stress and turmoil those two put you through. The house is yours. Take it. After that call, I felt a strange mix of emotions. I had managed to distance myself from two toxic people, and on top of that, I had been gifted a multi-million dollar mansion. It felt surreal, like something out of a movie. But it was real, and it was happening to me. The next few days were a whirlwind. I moved my belongings into the mansion and started to make it my own. Every room, every corner, became a testament to my resilience and strength. I decorated the house with a sense of newfound freedom and pride. I was no longer bound by the deceit and betrayal of Johnson and Mary. This house, this beautiful mansion, was a symbol of my victory over their treachery. As expected, Mary and Johnson were furious. They sent me constant threats, trying to intimidate me into giving up the house, but I stood my ground. Each time they sent a threat, I responded with a picture of a different part of the house, reminding them that it was mine, not theirs. I wanted them to see what they had lost, to feel the sting of their own actions. Revenge never felt so sweet. One evening, as I was sitting in the grand living room, surrounded by the opulence of the mansion, I reflected on everything that had happened. I thought about how much I had loved Johnson, how I tried to learn Spanish to communicate better with him and his family. I remembered the hurtful things they had said about me, their plans to leave me out of their lives. It had been a painful journey, but I had come out stronger on the other side. I received another call from Uncle Jack. Nancy, I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing. I'm doing well, Jack. Thank you for everything. The house is beautiful. I'm glad you like it. You deserve it after everything you've been through. I appreciate that. It means a lot to me. You know, Nancy, I've been thinking. Maybe you should consider staying in Spain for a while. You could use a change of scenery, and it might help you heal. That's a good idea, Jack. I think I will. Thank you for the suggestion. As I hung up the phone, I felt a sense of peace wash over me. The future was uncertain, but I knew I had the strength to face whatever came my way. I had overcome betrayal and heartbreak, and I had emerged victorious. This mansion was not just a house, it was a symbol of my resilience, my strength, and my ability to overcome any obstacle. In the end, I realized that the best revenge was living well. I had a beautiful home, a supportive family in Uncle Jack, and a bright future ahead of me. Mary and Johnson could stew in their own bitterness and regret, but I was moving forward with my life, and that, I knew, was the greatest revenge of all. My in-laws were drunk, but even though people around us were whispering to each other, my in-laws didn't seem to care as they kept yelling at me. Well, I guess it's too late since you're already married, but if you want to be part of this family, you need to show us you have enough money, they said. Yes, your dad is right. So, make sure to give us a thousand dollars a month as a new bonus, they added. I was stunned by their words. I couldn't believe they would say such things at a wedding reception. I just stared at them, my face going pale. My dad took the microphone from them. Enough is enough. Don't you realize you're making fools of yourselves, he said. My name is Linda. I am a 30-year-old office worker. I am currently dating someone named Larry who is 32 years old, two years older than me. I met him through a friend who was worried about me being single, so she introduced me to Larry. After dating for a year, Larry proposed, and now we are soon to be married. I lost my mother when I was very young, and my father raised me by himself. He worked very hard to take care of all my needs. I didn't have many worries growing up, but losing my mom, who I loved so much, deeply hurt me. Because I lost someone I cared about so much, I was cautious with my emotions. That's why I hadn't really dated anyone since my school days. I even thought it would be okay if I stayed single forever. Then I met Larry. 
At first, I didn't feel any romantic feelings for him, even though he asked me out many times. Larry really cared about me and was always a gentleman. Slowly, I began to open my heart to him, and we started dating. He kept caring for me, and I felt very happy. He became very special to me, and I started thinking I wanted to be with him forever. Then he proposed, and we decided to get married. Larry understood everything about me and was always kind to me, no matter what. Don't worry, if you're ever feeling unsure about something, I'll be here for you until you feel better. I love you, Linda. You can count on me, he would say. His words moved me. He promised to make me happy for the rest of my life. Just being with him warmed my heart. If he cared that much for me, I thought I should do the same for him. When I told my father that we decided to get married, he was so happy that he cried. Wow, Linda, you're finally getting married. I'm so happy for you, he said. Oh, Dad, you're being dramatic, I joked. Wow, I hadn't heard anything like that from you until now. I was always worried that you might never get married, he replied. Oh, really? I had no idea you were worried about that, I said. Well, every father worries about his daughter, you know. Anyway, congratulations, he said. Thanks, Dad, I replied. I was so happy to be congratulated by my dad, who had raised me by himself. I thought I would probably cry at the wedding, and my dad would probably cry even more since he was already crying now. With that, Larry and I started preparing for our wedding. We were both busy with our jobs, so our days were very hectic. We worked during the weekdays and made wedding preparations over the weekends. There was no time to rest. Our calendars were always full. On the rare day off, we were supposed to visit Larry's parents' house. I was going to meet Larry's parents for the first time. Larry had come over to meet my father right after he proposed to me. Originally, I had planned to visit Larry's parents right after that to introduce myself but they were very busy and our schedules never matched. Finally, some time passed and we managed to arrange a visit. As we arrived at his parents' house, I suddenly felt nervous. Don't worry, my parents are very kind, Larry reassured me. His words made me feel a bit better and I rang the doorbell. It was his mother who opened the door. Mom, I'm home, Larry said. Welcome home, Larry. It's so good of you to come his mother replied warmly as she talked with her son. I greeted her as politely as I could. Nice to meet you. My name is Linda, and I'm Larry's fiancé. I see, so you're Linda, she said. Her voice was much lower than when she spoke to Larry, and her smile vanished. She looked me up and down as if judging me. Then she led us to the living room, where her cold attitude didn't change. Linda, I'm curious about what you bring to the table. Larry is our treasure and our only child. If you're going to marry him, you need to be a suitable wife. Are you worthy of him? She asked, more like an interrogation. I was taken aback by her question. I hadn't expected such a cold attitude from my future mother-in-law and was at a loss for words. You're going to join our family, you know. Are you ready for that? She continued. True, marrying Larry meant joining his family. But it's not like Larry's family were the Kennedys or some well-known high-society family. It's not like I was marrying into a royal family. Why was I being asked to make such a commitment? Besides, I wasn't even going to live with them. I don't like being pressured with questions like these. As I was thinking about how to respond, his mother seemed impatient with my slow reply and scolded me harshly. When I ask you a question, answer me right away. You're so rude, she snapped. I'm asking if you're ready for this, she continued, raising her voice. Despite feeling overwhelmed, I managed to say, I hope that Larry and I will support each other in our marriage. When I said that, his mother was not convinced. What a naive thing to say. You aren't just going to support each other. You are supposed to support Larry. It's your job as a wife to support your husband. You don't even understand the basics, she criticized. Then, Larry's father, who was sitting next to her, intervened. Honey, calm down. Sorry about that, Linda. You must have been startled by my wife's words, he said, trying to ease the tension. 
It's all right, I replied, trying to remain calm. His mother is very protective of her only son. Maybe she was just nervous and spoke without thinking. Just then, Larry's brother walked in. He spoke in a quiet, calm, and gentle tone. He seemed like a kind man, which gave me a moment of relief. But that relief was short-lived. With a smile on his face, he said the most unexpected thing. What my wife says is actually justified. What concerns me the most is that you come from a single-parent family. What do you mean by that? I asked, confused. Well, being raised by just one parent doesn't have a good public image. We can't be too happy to have such a person become the wife of our only son, can we? He explained. Hold on a minute, I said, unable to let this comment slide. What is wrong with being raised by a single parent? My father worked very hard to raise me by himself. I am very thankful for my upbringing and I am proud of my father. Being raised by a single parent doesn't make me any less valuable. But they still argued, since you were missing one parent, you couldn't have learned how to be a good wife, do housework, and such. I responded, I did a lot of housework to help my father. I can also cook pretty well, so please don't say that. Despite my response, Larry's words ignored what I said, and he finally stated, I will allow you to marry Larry, but in exchange, you must promise to devote everything to us because we are Larry's parents. Can you promise me that? What? I was shocked. Wow, since you came here to ask for our permission to marry our son, you do know what your duties are, don't you? Before I could say more, he continued the conversation. I found that my in-laws had completely taken over the conversation, giving me little chance to respond. That night, as I thought more about the marriage, I decided to share my feelings with Larry. Say, Larry, do your parents always talk to people like that? What about it? Larry seemed unfazed. I was surprised that Larry didn't see anything wrong with what his parents had said to me. Well, I mean, the way your parents spoke to me and what they said. Oh, really? Well, they were just talking about whether you were ready for this marriage. I get that your parents are worried about their son's marriage, but I feel like what your parents were saying was a bit too much. Really? Why is that? My parents didn't say anything wrong. Besides, they've given us permission to get married, so don't worry about it. Hmm, <laughs> that's true, but I felt uneasy that Larry seemed to side with his parents more than with me, and that was very troubling. I guess he realized I was feeling unsure because he gave me a hug. Linda, you don't have to worry so much. My parents are just a bit upset because their only son is getting married, he said. He spoke as if he didn't fully support me. It's all going to be fine. Don't overthink it. I'm sure they just want what's best for us. They want us to be as good of a couple as they are. That's why they were a bit harsh. Oh, really? I replied. Like he said, maybe his parents have high expectations for us. But even if that's the case, I don't think it's right for them to belittle me because I was raised by my father. I don't think people who say such things make a good couple. We are the ones getting married and we should be the focus, not their approval or disapproval. With that perspective, although I was still a bit upset, I decided not to dwell too much on his parents' opinions. Then, the day of the wedding arrived. We had many guests, including our relatives, friends, colleagues, and bosses. I walked down the aisle with my father, who had raced me all my life. Larry and I exchanged our vows and rings. We were met with applause, and for the first time, I truly realized that I was getting married to Larry. I felt a happiness I had never felt before as we walked into the reception hall. We made our way through the crowd, greeted by videos of us as part of the entertainment. It was a joyful time. I chatted with friends I hadn't seen in a while, and many people congratulated us. Despite my earlier worries about his parents, I was glad I had decided to marry Larry. I was glad we decided to have a memorable day. After the ceremony, we planned to officially register our marriage and Frank, and I would become husband and wife. I cherished every moment and felt so happy. Time flew by, and soon it was time for the final part of the event. 
The bride, groom, and both sets of parents lined up to greet the guests, but I started to feel uneasy because of Frank's parents. We were all supposed to be standing in line, but his parents were wobbly on their feet. If you looked closely, you could see that their faces were bright red, they had drunk too much. Some relatives asked if they were okay. My in-laws were clearly drunk, but we had to wrap up the ceremony and get it over with. The moderator handed the microphone to me and Larry. Suddenly, Larry's mother snatched my hand away from him and yelled at me like a professional wrestler in the middle of a challenge. Listen to me, Linda. After this wedding, you are going to devote yourself to us completely. Prepare yourself because we are going to test you really hard. The guests started whispering to each other, and some even thought it was a joke and laughed. Then, Larry's father grabbed the microphone. Linda, don't you feel embarrassed to wear a dress like that? It doesn't suit you at all. Dear, you should tell her the truth, his mother chimed in. As expected, the whispers among the guests changed in tone. I looked at Larry, hoping he would stop his father's rude comments. But Larry said he couldn't do that and that his parents weren't doing anything wrong. It became clear he would never protect me from his parents in the future. That was the moment I realized it. I was certain of it, even as the hall buzzed around us. My in-laws were drunk and continued to insult me. Well, you're already married, but if you're going to be part of this family, you need to prove that you have enough money, they said. Yes, that's right, they continued. After you register your marriage at the city hall, you should give us a few thousand dollars a month and your entire bonus. I was shocked by their words. I never thought they would say such things at our wedding reception. I just stared at them, feeling my face go pale. My father took the microphone from them. Enough of this, don't you realize you're making fools of yourselves? He said, though still showing some respect. His parents glared at my father. Why are you interrupting us while we're talking? I knew this woman's father was no good. Single parents are never any good, they said. Why do they talk like this? How dare they insult my father? I thought, my father, keeping his cool, replied, you people are even worse than I imagined. You even refuse to meet me because I am a single father. I never thought that someone like you would work for President Scott. President Scott is such a respectable person. I assumed his employees would be decent as well, my father continued. At that, my father-in-law's face turned very serious. How do you know President Scott? He's a business partner of my company and, more importantly, an old friend of mine, my father explained. And speaking of single parents, President Scott was raised by his mother alone. So you just insulted the president of the company you work for. Seeing my in-laws' faces fall at my father's words, I realized they finally understood the mess they had gotten themselves into. I apologize, sir. Please don't tell the president about this, my in-law pleaded, suddenly falling to his knees. Just moments before, he had acted like he was in charge but now he looked defeated, and I could hear laughter from the guests. Some even pulled out their cell phones to record the scene. No matter how much you apologize, you can't take back your words, my dad said. He walked over to me and asked if I wanted to go home with him. I said yes and took the microphone from Larry's hand. Thank you for the great entertainment, but there will be no marriage, I announced to Larry and his parents. And to everyone who attended, I will make sure to return the money you gave us for this occasion. Then I left the reception hall with my dad. I caught a glimpse of Larry and his parents looking dismayed, and soon after, his relatives rushed over with worried expressions on their faces. The place must have been in complete chaos. As I returned their money, I apologized to the guests. They all expressed sympathy for me and praised me and my dad for our actions saying it was good that we weren't taken advantage of by such terrible people. Later, Larry's co-workers who had attended the reception must have spread the word about what happened at his company. Larry became known for having such unreasonable parents and was criticized for having a weak character. His embarrassment was so great that he resigned voluntarily. And of course, 
The president of my father-in-law's company found out about the incident. Larry's father was demoted and sent to an insignificant division of the company, transferred to a remote office in the countryside. I heard that Larry's family has been ostracized by all his relatives because of what happened at the wedding. While it's unfortunate, it really was their own doing, and sometimes things like that just can't be avoided. In the meantime, I've been using this opportunity to strengthen my relationship with my dad. We've been spending more quality time together, and it's helped me appreciate all he's done for me even more. One day, he sat me down for a serious talk. Linda, are you interested in running the business? He asked, looking at me with a mixture of hope and seriousness. Do you mean? I started, a bit unsure where he was heading with this. Why don't you work towards becoming the president of my company? He suggested. It was a big step, and he seemed to believe I was ready to take it on. I'll do my best. I promised him, feeling a mix of excitement and nervousness. I decided then to focus on stepping up my game at work, rather than getting entangled in romantic relationships for now. I wanted to prove to myself, and to my dad, that I could excel and perhaps one day be a great leader like him. Currently, I am deeply involved in learning everything I can at my dad's company. The work is challenging but fulfilling and I'm determined to make the most of this opportunity. Reflecting on the wedding fiasco, it's clear that Larry's in-laws were quite unreasonable, turning what should have been a beautiful event into a spectacle. Thankfully, since the marriage wasn't officially registered, Linda myself in this scenario was spared from a legally binding mistake. Now, free from any marital ties, and with no looming in-law issues, I can focus solely on my career aspirations. It's a relief to know that out of a chaotic situation came a clear path forward for me. I look forward to what the future holds and am excited about the potential of leading the company. I wish myself all the best and hope that anyone watching this story can take something valuable from it. Thank you for staying till the end. Please consider subscribing if you enjoyed this story, and I hope to see you in the next video. Families often have conflicts or financial problems, but there are also families who manage to stick together and make it through everyday life. It's pretty clear which one is happier, don't you think? My name is Rachel. I've been called an oddball since I was a child. I don't know what's different about me. I just know people say I'm different. Being called different isn't the problem. The real issue is being ignored by my own parents. This led to a lonely childhood for me. I've always been sensitive to people's emotions and can somehow understand what they're thinking. I don't know why I can do this. It's not like I can always see or feel it, but it's as natural to me as moving my hand or breathing. I found it strange and couldn't understand why others couldn't do the same. There was a time when I felt a bad vibe from a colleague my father brought home from work. I warned my mother to be careful with that person, but she didn't listen. Later on, that colleague tricked my father into signing a contract as a guarantor for a loan. Although my mother didn't take my advice, when my father stepped away from the table with his colleague, I told him, Dad, something is telling me that the word joint is dangerous. I don't know what joint means but please be careful. So, my father hesitated and refused to sign as a joint guarantor. Thanks to that, when my colleague went bankrupt and couldn't repay the debt, my father was able to avoid taking on all the debt. Another day, when I was shopping with my mother, I felt a wave of discomfort coming from behind us. When I turned around, I felt this bad feeling coming from a man wearing sunglasses and a hat. I said, Mom, let's take that side street. I grabbed my mother's hand and moved to the side street. My mother was confused and asked what was wrong, but just as we moved, we heard someone shout, thief, from the street we had been on. The man with the bad vibe had snatched a woman's purse and ran off. The woman fell and got hurt badly. If we hadn't moved to the side street, the man's target would have been my mother. Things like this happened often and people started to think I was strange and mysterious. My parents began to avoid me, and I felt lonely and isolated. 
What seemed normal to me was not normal to others. I started keeping my thoughts to myself. I stopped expressing my feelings because I knew normal people don't feel what I feel. If I didn't say anything, they wouldn't think I was weird. I would just be like a normal kid. I have a sister, Julie, who's four years younger than me. Unlike me, Julie is a regular kid. As the years went by, I became more withdrawn, but Julie just got cuter and more charming. It was clear who everyone preferred. Our parents started to favor Julie over me. They would say, Julie is such a lovely girl, but Rachel seems to be a bit on the darker side. They noticed I had become less odd lately, but still thought I was different. What they called odd was me not talking about things only I could sense. It was my way of dealing with the world. I was tired of how this ability of mine was torturing me, so I tried hard to suppress it. I wondered if my attempts to hide myself and appear normal were making me seem abnormal, or if once labeled as the odd kid, that image just couldn't be erased. I grew up without much love from my parents. On the other hand, Julie received all the love, including what should have been mine. Julie, who was spoiled and pampered, sensed our parents being cold and distant toward me. She started to look down on me. I don't like being around you. Your gloominess rubs off on me. I'm so cute, but your loner image brings me down. Julie started to insult me whenever she got the chance. Our parents lightly scolded Julie, but they never seriously tried to correct her. When I was in 8th grade and Julie was in 5th grade, she was scouted by a talent agency on the street. I knew it. It's because I'm cute. They said I could even appear on TV, Julie said, pleased with herself. She started dreaming big, and our parents didn't seem entirely against it. You should calm down and think carefully. I sensed something shady about this. I spoke up, expressing the intuition that I had long suppressed because I didn't want Julie to get into trouble. Julie, who didn't know about my unique ability, said, What's your problem? Are you just jealous because you're not cute and nobody approached you? Don't say weird things and stop interfering with me. She seemed furious. Even my parents, who knew about my ability, either forgot about it or were too excited about Julie standing on the glamorous stage. They sided with Julie and criticized me. After that, I resolved to remain silent again. I told myself that there was nothing good in saying unnecessary things. One day, a student teacher came to my junior high school. He was a male college student who graduated from the school and wanted to be a physical education teacher. As he shared his dreams about education and gave a strong greeting, the teacher and students, especially the female students, were charmed. When he responded cheerfully to the girls' excited cheers, I sensed a dark aura from him. I had always vowed to hide my unique abilities, but seeing my classmates potentially in danger, I decided to break my self-imposed rule. I chose a teacher who seemed understanding and talked to her. I know this is sudden, but please believe me and help me, I said. The teacher was puzzled by my sudden request, but agreed to stake out a certain location after school, just as I asked. I didn't tell the teacher the details. I had no reason to think she would believe me, but the fact that she agreed to help without any explanation made me think she wasn't an ordinary person either. The next day, the school was in an uproar. The male student teacher was arrested for violating a public nuisance prevention ordinance. The location where the teacher staked out was near the girls' restroom. Within 10 minutes of starting the stakeout, the student teacher appeared, entered the girls' restroom, and installed a video camera. The teacher caught him in the act. Thanks to that, the female students were saved from being secretly filmed, and their dignity was protected. Meanwhile, my sister, who had joined the talent agency, was proudly telling everyone about it. But there were no real lessons or auditions. She only had to pay expensive membership and lesson fees. Then, suddenly, the agency closed down, leaving an empty shell. In short, my sister was scammed. She cried and screamed, directing her anger at me. It's all because you said weird things. My future is ruined, and it's all your fault. It didn't make any sense, 
but my sister seemed to truly believe it. Maybe that's the only way she could handle it. For me, it was a disaster and a nuisance. Our parents didn't say such unreasonable things, but their attitude became more distant toward me and more supportive of my sister. I ended up feeling lonely again, as the odd one out. I was happy that I could help everyone at school, but I was terrified that my actions would corner me. That's when I received a call from the teacher who had listened to my story, asking me to come to the staff room. Worried that I would be labeled as strange again, I opened the door to the teacher's staff room. You knew something like that was going to happen, didn't you? The teacher asked me in a low voice, without any preamble. Thinking there was no point in pretending, I gathered my courage and told the teacher about my mysterious power. I thought so. I know there are very few people like you, the teacher said. For the first time, someone showed understanding for my situation. The teacher said they knew someone with a power like mine, and that's why they could understand. Actually, that person is my aunt, and I've been listening to her stories for a long time. You must be worried about a lot of things because of your power. Maybe getting advice from someone who's been in your shoes will help clear your mind. Saying that, the teacher introduced me to the person. The person looked at me with kind eyes and said, It's natural to be worried, but you don't need to suffer. I was drawn to their gentle yet deep eyes that seemed to see through everything. The person's name was Hannah, and she had the same kind of power as me since she was a child. She had experienced a lot of struggles and hiding herself throughout her life. The stories from my senior who had gone through the same experiences helped me release my worries and doubts. From this day on, my interactions with Hannah began. I called Hannah my mentor, but she just gave a wry smile and said, please don't. Thanks to Hannah, or rather my mentor, I changed. I had been living my life quietly, trying to stay unnoticed, but as my awareness grew, I gradually began to live a normal life as an ordinary girl. However, since the incident with the talent agency, I haven't been able to reconcile with my sister. If anything, it feels like we're drifting apart. It's become normal for her not to talk to me, and when she does, it's just to complain or insult me for no reason. I often have no idea what triggers her mood switches. My power couldn't predict my sister's emotional changes either. Just because you got into college doesn't mean you're all that. It's not even that great of a school, and you're so happy-go-lucky, she would say. My sister, who had hoped to get into her top-choice high school, ended up at her second-choice school. Because of that, she got mad when I got into my first-choice college. It's not like I bragged to her, she just dissed me because of her own frustrations. Our parents only tried to appease my upset sister and kept their distance from me, as if telling me to stay away from her. It seemed that my sister didn't like the fact that I had become brighter since meeting my mentor. To my sister, I had to be a dark and gloomy girl who was inferior to her. But my sister is really smart. It was surprising that she failed her high school entrance exams. Of course, she was filled with frustration and poured all of that into studying at her new high school. As a result, she was at the top of her class for all four years, and got accepted into a prestigious national university on her first try. I got into the most difficult university. Your college doesn't even come close to mine, she boasted. I lightly responded with, that's true, to my satisfied sister because I knew nothing good would come from getting too involved with her. However, my sister thought that my light reaction was belittling her accomplishments and unleashed a barrage of verbal abuse at me. Both my parents were at their wit's end with my sister, who couldn't be calmed down once she lost her temper. All they could do was watch nervously. They blamed me for causing the trouble and eventually ended up calling me a troublemaker. I wanted to argue back about who the real problem child was, but I always swallowed my words to avoid complicating things further. Setting aside my sister's issues, as I approached college graduation, I had to seriously confront my own career path. I was no longer as introverted as I used to be, 
I still struggled with socializing and had little confidence in building good relationships with others. My ability allowed me to detect people's negative emotions. While I could sense positive emotions too, it seemed people were more prone to negative ones, which made detecting such negativity painful for me. Throughout my school life, I was tormented by these swirling negative emotions and had come close to losing faith in people. Could someone like me really manage to work at a company? I decided to consult my mentor about this dilemma. I wanted to learn how she had overcome similar issues, as I was sure she had faced them as well. I have experienced the same worries as you. Maybe you should consider doing the kind of work I do, she suggested. My mentor used to work as a fortune teller and a counselor, helping people resolve their problems. She could use her abilities to their fullest extent and contribute to the world and people around her. Also, she was able to work freelance, which meant she didn't have to belong to any organization. This way, there were fewer chances of getting entangled in human relationships or being affected by other people's emotions. It's the perfect job for people like us, she said. Encouraged by my mentor, I decided to pursue the same line of work. She taught me everything, from how to do the job to how to acquire clients. Nowadays, thanks to the internet, it's possible to work from home without any issues. When I told my parents and sister that I would not seek employment after graduation and work from home instead, they responded, What's that? What kind of job is that? Seems so dumb. You'll be home all the time. At least make sure to do the housework. Can you even make a living doing that? How will you cover living expenses? Well, as long as you contribute to the household, do whatever you want. While I expected such a response from my parents, it made me feel a little lonely that they didn't support me more. I felt sad thinking about their demands for housework and money. My mood darkened, and so my life working from home began. At first, I didn't have any job requests and struggled day by day. But with my mentor's help, I gradually got the hang of it and started to make a living. For about a year, I couldn't contribute financially to the household, so I focused on doing the housework. My dad seemed unsatisfied, but my mom was relieved and kept him in check. After about a year, when I finally started contributing financially, my dad mocked me by saying, Oh, finally, you're able to earn some pocket change, huh? but I could tell he was actually quite satisfied with the money. However, even though I was contributing, the amount of housework I had to do didn't decrease, and our lives remained unchanged. Then, after another three years, my sister graduated from college and secured a job at a foreign company. Unlike you, I'm an elite. You're just unemployed, living at the bottom of the barrel. It's so depressing to have you as a sister, she would say. My sister, who had successfully landed a job, started to belittle me for working from home. What are you even doing working from home? That's just like playing. You're nothing more than a parasite living at home. At times, she'd say, it's really weird not to work outside. I'm working hard, earning everyone's respect, and now I've been promoted to teen leader. My pay is going to increase, and I'm probably earning about five times more than you. There's no way a homedy like you can earn that much. My sister, who was promoted to teen leader after only a year and a half at the company, kept one-upping me and looking down on me. She boasted about her good salary, but hardly contributed any money to the household and didn't help with the chores at all. Laundry, cleaning, preparing meals, everything was dumped onto mom and me. When I say mom and me, mom mostly left it to me so I was basically doing everything. Whenever I said to her, Julie, you should take care of yourself a little. You shouldn't just spend all your money on fun. You should contribute to the household too. She just dismissed me, saying, you, the unemployed, can handle the chores. I'm saving my money for my future. Our parents also just let her do what she pleased for some inexplicable reason of, it's Julie, it can't be helped. I was used to my current lifestyle, and it was a comfortable environment for me to work, so I wanted to keep it that way, but I was starting to consider how to take care of myself. 
Then came the bombshell announcement from my sister. Without any prior warning, both our parents and I were taken aback as she continued. He's a real elite with an annual income. She sneered at me and added, Marriage is just a pipe dream for someone unemployed like you, isn't it? She said she would bring her boyfriend over the next Sunday. With the rapid succession of sudden developments, Sunday came and we were still reeling. The man my sister brought along looked like a successful young man, impeccably dressed in a sharp suit. Nice to meet you. My name is Jack, he said. I would like to ask for your permission to marry Julie, Jack said, greeting us properly and showing good manners. Isn't he wonderful? Just as I said, I'm going to be so happy with this man, Julie gushed. So Jack, what do you do for a living? Dad managed to ask clearly impressed by Jack's presence. Yes, I'm currently training at a company that my father knows, Jack replied. We were puzzled by the word training, and then Julie said gleefully, his father is the president. He's training now to take over the presidency in the future. My sister seemed over the moon about becoming a future president's wife. Afterward, we had various conversations, and Jack left stylishly. There were a few things that made me raise an eyebrow during the conversation, but my parents were thrilled with the high-status man. However, I felt an inexplicable dark shadow from that seemingly refreshing and good-natured man, Jack. It was something only I could sense, so I didn't know how to explain it. I could no longer remain silent, fearing that marrying a man with hidden issues would make my sister unhappy. Julie, you've only been dating him for less than four months. You might want to understand him a little more before deciding to get married, I cautioned, driven by a strong gut feeling. Sis, he's an elite and a future CEO. You won't find anyone better than him. Oh, I see, you're jealous, aren't you? You're bitter because you're comparing your life to my happy one. Poor jobless sis, she retorted. Even our parents got angry at me for interfering with Julie's happiness. You're just unemployed, so at the very least, stop interfering with your sister's happiness, they said. It was clear that our parents were hoping to secure a comfortable old age by marrying Julie off to a wealthy man. Frustrated by my inability to effectively communicate my concern about the dark shadow I sensed looming over Julie, my head was spinning. In the meantime, the two got engaged, and a meeting between both families took place. Jack's parents, like him, carried an air of freshness about them, but I felt the same ominous cloud hidden behind them. However, I was unable to convey this danger to my overjoyed sister and parents. Before I knew it, the day of the wedding had arrived. The CEO of our company is attending today's reception. Can you comprehend how much I'm appreciated and anticipated in my company? I guess it's a kind of honor that a shut-in like you wouldn't understand, my sister said gleefully before leaving the house. She always included some derogatory words directed at me. At the wedding ceremony held at a hotel, the couple who pledged eternal love to each other entered the reception hall. Watching my sister, who was beaming with joy, I worried about how long this happiness would last. As my sister mentioned, the CEO made a keynote speech, full of praise for her, which delighted her. Once the speeches were over, food and drinks were served to each table. There were all sorts of delicious-looking dishes, but I started to feel a sense of discomfort. Gradually, I realized that no dishes were being served in front of me. At first, I thought my meal was just late but other tables were already being served drinks, appetizers, and so on, one after another. Clearly, something was off. Nothing was being delivered to me. People at the same table began to notice this oddity and started whispering among themselves. At that moment, my sister came over to me and whispered into my ear with laughter in her voice. We didn't prepare free meals for the unemployed. After all, it's such a waste to serve such food to a jobless person. You should just eat potato chips at home. Just leave your gift money and go home. This outrageous remark was spoken loudly in my ear, and my ears rang. Jack, 
sitting at the groom's table, was grinning and nodding. Even our parents, who at first seemed surprised, said, Well, it's true, Rachel is jobless after all. I was first taken aback, then a wave of anger surged up within me. I never thought you'd stoop this low, sis. Mom and Dad, this is unacceptable. How could you accept such rudeness? My parents just scowled at me, never bothering to reprimand my sister. Fine, I get it. I'm leaving, but don't come crying to me later, I said. You sound like a sore loser, she shot back. Amidst the chaos of this unbelievable turn of events, a man suddenly stood up. Sorry to interrupt, I'm the groom's brother, Larry. My brother and parents are trash, but it seems the bride is even worse. I can't take it anymore, said the man who introduced himself as Larry. He continued, Dad, your company went bankrupt five months ago, didn't it? Pretending to still be a CEO is just a scheme to mooch off the bride and her family. Jack will never become a CEO. He's planning to leech off his wife while pretending otherwise. He's unemployed now. Larry's words caused a commotion among the guests, but my sister was the most heated. What do you mean you lied to me? What do you mean unemployed? She demanded, her face turning from red to blue, her eyes welling up with tears. Our parents, their assumptions proven wrong, began to yell and curse. The anguished cries of my family echoed throughout the venue. The groom and his parents remained silent, looking sulky. Before the ceremony, I had received a confession and apology from Larry and asked him to speak his mind without reservation if something happened during the reception. As my sister was berating Jack with a wrathful face, another man couldn't take it anymore and stood up. It was the president of my sister's company. Enough already. This is embarrassing. You have no right to criticize the groom. What do you think about your terrible attitude towards your own sister? The president's angry voice made my sister's face contort in fear. For one, I didn't attend your wedding for your sake. I wouldn't have come if you weren't the sister of Rachel. Suddenly, my name was mentioned by the president, and my sister's eyes widened in surprise. Huh? Who are you talking about? Rachel is a goddess to many of us business owners, rescuing countless companies from the brink of collapse, he continued. In fact, with the guidance of my mentor, I have been working as an advisor for corporate revitalization and growth. Starting with fortune-telling and life consultation, I used my abilities to show companies the path they should take. All my advice was spot on, and the companies that sought my help experienced a rapid resurgence in business, achieving a V-shaped recovery. As a result, I had earned titles like teacher and goddess. My sister's company had also consulted with me five months ago, and thanks to my advice, it had been reborn as a stronger enterprise. The president, grateful for my assistance, attended the wedding today as well. I had no idea. You're not just a basement-dwelling unemployed nobody, are you? My sister said, finally realizing the truth. Thanks to my thriving career, her assumptions had been shattered. I now earn several times what you do. Despite contributing significantly to the household income, our parents never seemed to care about me. They thought that money was from Julie. Oh, we thought July provided that money, they said, misunderstanding the situation. There was no way Julie would have been contributing money to the house. The wedding reception turned into a chaotic scene and was called off. Naturally, all the guests were fully refunded their wedding gifts. I've already signed a contract for an apartment under my name. I can't afford it on my own, especially now that he's unemployed, my sister sobbed. Jack retorted, you're the one who signed the contract. I don't know anything about that. The wedding was a complete disaster, resulting from my sister's malice towards others. She may argue there were reasons for her behavior, but they didn't hold up. Afterward, Julie divorced Jack and claimed alimony. Since Jack was jobless and his parents didn't have much, she couldn't receive much alimony. She barely managed to pay for the wedding venue, let alone the apartment she had contracted. The place that was supposed to be their love nest was never occupied and was cancelled. However, 
The debt didn't simply vanish, and Julie found herself heavily burdened by loans. Moreover, her outrageous behavior at the wedding quickly became known among her colleagues, leading to a rapid decline in her reputation. The CEO had no choice but to demote her. With no place left in the company and having lost her pride as an elite, Julie wanted to quit and run away, but she had to bear the embarrassment for the sake of loan repayment. She continued with a trivial job in a hardly noticeable basement storage room. Jack and his parents, who had failed in their plan to leech off Julie, were now scraping by with occasional day labor. Naturally, Jack's elder brother, Gary, had cut off all ties with his parents and brother. The parents quickly gave up on Julie when she hit rock bottom and tried to cozy up to me instead. To them, I said, I've had enough of being manipulated by you. I'm cutting ties. Goodbye forever. I declared this and moved out to start a new life in a newly rented apartment. They took in the fallen Julie, who was struggling to make ends meet. Julie's salary was drastically reduced, and she couldn't possibly contribute to the household expenses, of course. I stopped the money I was contributing to the house as well. Without my financial help and unable to lower their standard of living, our parents quickly became exhausted and struggled every day to make ends meet. They were panting and stressed, trying to maintain the lifestyle they had grown used to, but without the necessary income, it became a daily challenge. On the other hand, my work was thriving. I was able to guide many companies and individuals in the right direction, using my abilities to help them succeed. My reputation grew, and more clients sought my advice. This success brought me a sense of fulfillment and financial stability. It felt good to finally be appreciated for my skills and to see the positive impact I was making on others' lives. After the wedding incident, I started dating Larry. He had been so honest and brave during that chaotic time, and we grew close. He recently proposed to me, and I accepted. If everything goes well, marriage could be in our future. Larry is a man of pure heart, with no dark shadows lurking within him. Unlike the people my sister had surrounded herself with, Larry was genuine and kind. I'm looking forward to building a happy life with Larry. Together, we dream of a future filled with love, mutual respect, and understanding. With him by my side, I feel a sense of hope and excitement for what lies ahead. We've talked about our plans, our dreams, and how we want to support each other in everything we do. As I reflect on everything that has happened, I feel a mix of emotions. I am relieved to have cut ties with my parents and sister, who never appreciated me. I am proud of the person I have become, despite the challenges I faced, and I am grateful for Larry, who has brought light and love into my life. Looking forward, I see a bright future. I am excited about the possibility of marriage with Larry and the life we will build together. With him, I know I will never have to hide who I am or feel unappreciated. Our love and partnership are based on honesty and mutual support, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for us.